So it's uh, late July 2024, just down here at <coughs> Liscombe, just north of Dorchester, which is a recent acquisition by Dorset Wildlife Trust, Natural England and some uh, private supporters. So looking north at the moment towards uh, Liscombe Bottom, but we're going to head south and look at the Southern Arable. Go up this way, it's a public footpath that goes up, kind of follows the stream valley, then goes up onto the what was arable and what is uh, part of the holding. Uh, so, we'll become well, the plan here is to rewild, rewild the farm, it's about 335 hectares, I believe, so fairly chunky. Was organic the farmland. So there's quite a legacy there of uh, some pretty nice wildlife to build on. Uh, so we've got sites of special scientific interest here and uh, sites of nature conservation importance, both of which are dominated by chalk grassland, species rich chalk grassland, which provides a really nice kind of a uh, source populations, sort of relictual source populations of the kinds of wildflowers and invertebrates and birds and what have you that will naturally spread out across what's a basically a chalk holding, chalk landscape. This is a little piddle, or maybe the Liscombe Stream, I can't really tell, I think the Ordnance Survey map calls it the Liscombe Stream, but um Others call it the little piddle, but this may not be a little, the little piddle, it may just be a branch of it. You can see the slopes here. I'm not going to go up onto that slope, but that's where some of the nice chalk grassland wildflower species are. So we're now down at the, uh, the southern end, the southern arable of uh, Liscombe. Kind of looking southeast now. It's quite a large arable field with a nice little kind of a coom in the middle. Some uh, hay bales, so I think this has been whole crop silage or whole crop of some sort anyway. Um, and it's just been cut, just been harvested. Like I say it's late July now, coming into August. So hopefully the corn buntings that are in here have uh, managed to get their broods off. They obviously nest out in the arable. It's a good area for corn buntings here. See more of those than yellow hammers, although I believe there are more yellow hammers here in general. So one uh, one question here is how to how to set this area up for wildlife to recolonize this arable. Um, there's one big arable field here and another one just over this hedge of roughly the same size and another one or two further along. So we're a bit, a bit away from the kind of the seed sources, the triple SI on the chalk grassland. In terms of herbaceous species we've obviously got some nice hedges wrapped around the field. Um, so you could uh, put a big ring fence around if you wanted to fence it at all. Um, probably wouldn't need to if you were just going to basically step back and allow allow uh, nature to make the best it can of this kind of a situation and recolonize under completely under its own steam. But bearing in mind there are some dispersal agents completely missing from the landscape because we've made them extinct, such as oryx and uh, tarpan, European wild horse. A wild boar and uh, there are deer so they would presumably disperse some of the wildflowers and there's the wind as well which would be good particularly for the grasses and 
uh, napwees and that kind of stuff, presumably. But um, what nature is confronted here is a depleted kind of larger megafauna type, trophic level, um, which would also have been presumably important dispersal agents for seeds. And the uh, question there is, do you actually intervene to help nature out in the early years given that situation? And I certainly would say on this arable, it's fairly, the ground is still fairly open. It's free draining, so a lot of the kind of the nitrates that might be in here will be kind of working their way through the system quite quickly. Phosphates will still be locked in, presumably. So in terms of herbaceous wildflowers, there'll be a certain seed bank left, probably quite modest. In terms of herbaceous species, there's obviously annual wildflowers as well, given this has been arable for quite a long time, for an awful long time. So I think uh, the recolonisation of this area would be pretty slow, given the lack of things like wild cattle and uh, wild horses. Somebody needs to do some research to look more closely at to what extent those kinds of larger animals did disperse seed in more natural systems and um, which species as well. Because obviously not all herbaceous species need big megafauna to disperse them, but some do, presumably, and which ones do? And are there consequences of those big things not being here? So like I say, one option is just to basically step back and enjoy nature recolonizing. I think you do need to intervene a little bit in the early years. So in these kind of big arable fields where the sward is open still, um, that's a better kind of context for natural recolonization of herbaceous species than uh, improved grassland, for instance. So you haven't got a clean slate because you've got plenty of grasses and annual species and there's a yellow hammer, that sort of thing in the sward, or in the stubble as it is now. So in terms of herbaceous species, what I would do here, firstly I would uh, kind of rough up the ground surface. So it's quite, it is quite undulating, but I think, I assume, it, there would have been much more varied kind of micro topography in a more natural system on these kinds of soils. So if at all possible, I'd come in here with bulldozers or you know some way of um, basically digging out some pools, scrapes, scrape down to the chalk subsoil which is not very deep here and um, create some hollows and hills and hillocks and meandering dikes and that kind of stuff. Uh, dew ponds mainly uh, possibly if they would uh, work in this kind of a context. Just uh, vary the ground surface quite a lot and that would provide a more varied template for recolonization of uh, plants and invertebrates and birds in the longer term. But also what I would do is bring in some herbaceous, inoculated a bit with herbaceous species. So not necessarily from the triplet's eye on Liscombe, but we have got um, some fairly species rich, reseeded, um, arable reversion areas in Liscombe Bottom, which were seeded, I believe, from Salisbury Plain training area from SAC, upright brome type, CG3 type, chalk grassland. So they're quite nice now. There's quite a nice kind of founder population of wildflowers in those grasslands. So if you can use a brush harvester on those fields, which are not triple as I, and bring the seed over to here and just inoculate relatively small patches of a few square meters, maybe 10 square meters or less scattered around this larger arable field, all of these large southern arable fields, you'd at least bring seed sources into these arable uh, areas and um, speed up the recolonization of those open, sun-loving, herbaceous species. And what I would also do is, uh, if we can find brash, so uh, cuttings from hedges and then um, drag some of those out towards the middle of this, these fields, these big arable fields. Um, distributed higgledy piggledy, so no, no order to the distribution of these piles of brash. 
and then just lob blackberries into those brash piles. So you basically replicate blackbirds pooping and song thrushes and field fares and red wings pooping into those brash piles and you'll get an early kind of flush of bramble hopefully that way. Obviously the birds will do it too but you're just kind of helping them a bit. And you've got oak trees here, there's an oak. If that is producing acorns, which presumably it will be, there's another one just over there, I believe. Is that a, let's look through bins. No, that's a holly, that's nice. So I've got one oak at the edge of this field. So collect some acorns from there and probably plant those into the, amongst those brash piles. The brash piles will provide some protection for the emerging bramble and uh, woody species that might colonise those piles. Just enough time for them to get away. So that's three things I've suggested so far. One is jazzing up the land surface to put kind of um, micro topography back into these arable fields. Then um, inoculate some small patches distributed around with um, herbaceous chalkgrass and wildflower species that will then be gradually able to spread out from those inoculated patches and do the same with the shrubby and woody species by creating brash piles and lobbing in some seeds, maybe planting some cuttings of a blackthorn, maybe some whips of hawthorn, that kind of stuff. And over time obviously the birds will start to use those brash piles and poop out seeds. It's just kicking, kickstart the process of natural colonisation. There are seed sources around this field, so what have we got here? There's some blackthorn, there's an elder, hawthorn there, more elder, bramble, there's a field maple over there I can see. So there's a few species, there's not many of the, so I haven't seen any, um, uh, well there's wayfaring tree, there's a chalk shrub, there's the other one whose name I've forgotten, um, but there's some chalk shrub species which I've not seen on this on Liscombe yet. I'm sure they're here somewhere. There's wild privet there as well. That's nice. So there are species and elder obviously. I mean alder. Ash. No not alder. Ash. And uh, cornus. Um, hazel. Yeah so the three things. Uh, jazz up the land surface inoculated wildflowers, herbaceous wildflowers in some patches and create brash piles which will be the focal point of uh, regenerating blobs of uh, trees and shrubs and then over time they will spread out from those early interventions and in terms of to graze or not to graze or to browse or not to browse so obviously you've got some deer here quite a few deer here I would assume um, that's fine, they're kind of your meso herbivores, your small herbivores. We have lost, obviously, um, your uh, oryx and European wild horse, tarpan and wild boar. So I think having taurus cattle, uh, probably Exmoor ponies and um, wild boar if I had my way, but otherwise domestic pigs to um, help to sculpt the landscape as it develops in a way that um, oryx and European wild horse and wild boar would do under a more natural system. So you can criticise that, but in kind of basically livestock onto these kind of sites. I don't, I think it's, you know, it, you could just acknowledge that the um, that humanity made oryx and European wild horse and in our, you know, here, um, wild boar extinct or ex extirpated wild boar and made the other two globally extinct you can just say well you know it is what it is we'll just let re rewilding or wilding take place despite the lack of those big species I don't really subscribe to that approach although I think just accepting their absence and allowing rewilding to proceed in their absence is fair enough in some sites I think at this site we want to get some of the grazers and browsers back in using surrogates. So it's kind of a not all size fits all. You can have two different approaches, the kind of a 
activist kind of early activist approach to rewilding where you try and put right some of the wrongs that humanity's uh, inflicted on these kind of landscapes or you can have a laissez-faire kind of stand back and watch wildlife reassemble despite what damage we've done in terms of removing oryx and wild horse are both entirely legitimate approaches I think. I think at this site the approach you want to take is a having some grazing and browsing megafauna back in and that's going to have to be exmoors and longhorns, cattle, something like that. Um, and pigs pending our ability to get wild boar back here. Just walking over to the other arable field directly adjacent to the one we just looked at. See it's another big one. A few hectares. Same kind of prescription to be honest. So I'm going to be very controversial now and just say that um, you know I think what I've described here is rewilding in this kind of context, including the use of surrogates. I think the use of surrogates opens up two different trajectories for a site like this. So there's the rewilding trajectory, which is what the landowner here is pursuing. And there's the conservation grazing wood pasture type trajectory where you do actually have livestock and you harvest them and you produce wild meat and that kind of stuff. So that's one of the great things about this approach to nature recovery. It works both in a rewilding context where you do basically stand back once you've done some early interventions, but it also works in a, a high nature value farming sort of context where the landowner wants to basically produce high quality meat and wants to harvest their cattle and their pigs. Not sure about the ponies. Um, to make money out of food production, the biodiversity outputs outcomes will be quite similar uh, uh, at one level but not at another because basically in the rewilding approach it's completely open-ended how this will develop in the very long term. You have very low levels of grazing cattle, very small numbers of wild horse conics or whatever, uh, exmoors, and some uh, wild pigs, eventually wild boar hopefully, but beyond you know kind of dictating that they will be in this landscape you basically let the landscape do what it likes and it may turn into closed canopy woodland it may turn into wood pasture certainly in the first three four or five decades it will be early successional open shrubland with developing trees coming through the protective kind of shield of shrubs and you know beyond my lifetime who knows how it will develop under that scenario in the very long term Anyway, hope you've enjoyed this video. Do give some comments. If you'd like to, in the comments section below, do subscribe to the channel. And uh, like I say, this is Liscombe, which is owned by the Dorset Wildlife Trust, Natural England, and some private kind of contributors towards the land purchase. It's a very exciting project, so we'll come back in a few years and just see what these arable fields look like. Currently, they're being topped to deplete nutrient levels and you know so the local farmers have some hay that they can use and some whole crop feed for their stock but um after the next you know after th this harvesting takes place there will continue to be some harvesting in some fields just to continue to, dep to deplete nutrient levels but beyond that that will stop on the whole and um those early interventions will set the place uh, on its rewilding journey. So yeah, do subscribe, like the channel, and uh, I'll see you at the next video.